Um, and the first activity that we're going to do, um, we did it as one big group upstairs, but I think down here we're going to do it by row or by a couple of rows um, after Dane and I role model. And I was really happy um, listening to the speakers this morning that I decided to start us off with that at this activity. Um, this is a healing practice that I was fortunate to be introduced to um, when doing some focus group work uh, with young people, and this was sort of the way they brought young people together in their space. And there were sort of two things that were said this morning that um, made this seem particularly appropriate. First, there was um, our, poet pre our poetry presentation, where he said it took until he was 15 years old for somebody to ask him where he was from. Um, and so we are going to really get to know each other a little bit and talk about where we're from. Um, and then the very, very beginning piece of the day where we talked about making sure that we see and recognize each other. So that's what we're going to do with this exercise. Um, and my people who are resistant to moving, please come closer. If you are in the back half of the room, please come to the front half of the room so that we can have some good conversations together. Uh, so the practice is called Name Home Ancestor. And um, all you do is you say, you share your name, you share your home, whatever that means for you, and an ancestor that you would like to invoke in the conversation. That could be a literal ancestor, like somebody in your family, or it could be a collective ancestor, somebody uh, from the struggle or that you admire or somebody that you know of. Um, and the part I forgot to say this morning that I will say now, um, because this happened in the focus group where we did it, you can do that in any language that is comfortable for you. Um, so when we did this, uh, we had introductions in Filipino and Chukis and Japanese and Korean, all kinds of languages that I didn't understand. My transcriber hated it, but it was really, truly beautiful. Um, so Dana and I are going to role model what this looks like. And then I would say we're going to put two rows together and we're going to take a few minutes for you all to introduce yourselves to each other using Name Home Ancestor. So my name, as you've already heard, is Neo Espe. Home for me now is Washington, D.C., but I'm originally from New Haven, Connecticut, and before that my family is from the Caribbean. Um, and the ancestor that I brought in earlier that I will bring in again is my mother, Tony Wright. Hi, everyone. My name is Dana Fields Johnson. Uh, my home is originally Portsmouth, Virginia. Um, and, uh, but I tell people my home is wherever family is because I know I have a home wherever they are. And then the ancestor I would like to invoke is my grandmother. Her name was Mabel Fields and she raised me as her own. All right, so everybody who grew up, group up about two rows together, move around if you have to, get close so you all can see each other. And we're going to take about, eh, it'll probably take about 10 minutes for you all to introduce yourselves to each other using Name Home Ancestor. And go. Great. Uh, okay, thank you all. Um, so one of the things, there are many things I really appreciate about that exercise. Um, but like I said, in light of what we heard from some of our speakers and panelists this morning, this is something that you all can take home with you all pretty easily, right? And do with young people that you work with as a way to sort of bring the group together and connect. And I don't know, this happened this morning, I suspect it probably happened now. There were some common themes that were running through which ancestors were being called, different types of stories that we heard in that process. So it's a great way for us to um, connect with each other and connect with who we are and where we're coming from in conversations. So we already did the first item on the agenda. Um, for the rest of the time, um, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the pieces that I talked about this morning in terms of historical and cultural trauma and the role of cultural supports in addressing those um, based on a report that I did back in the spring that's called Behind the Asterisk. And then there's another series of reports that I did called Policy for Transformed Lives which will take us more into a partnership conversation and how to think about collaboration and partnership. Um, and like I said, we're trying to keep it interactive, so I hope you all like your groups that you were just chatting in, because we'll be doing some more chatting um, throughout the workshop. Uh, we'll do some questions and we'll do some final reflections, just to give a heads up. That final reflection, you are going to want to have your phone handy, so um, we won't need it until then, but just when we get close, just make sure your phone's not too far away, because we'll want to use that. Okay, so um, behind the asterisk, like I mentioned, that's a report that I did that came out in the spring. Um, we led with this quote called, we're not really known, because the report really focused on talking to some groups of young people that often, you often don't hear about in national policy conversations for sure, probably some local policy conversations as well. 
Um, so to get to some technical definitions, so small communities are those whose numbers are too small in nationally representative data samples to be considered reliable and therefore often go unreported. There may be some folks who are from groups in this room that are, some, are called asterisk groups, um, where what will happen in the report is um, it'll just have a little star where the information for that group should be, if the group's name is even listed at all. Um, it's because when you take a nationally representative sample, you're sort of randomly trying to pick people, and the chance that you're gonna pick enough people from a small group for your data to be reliable is small, right? Um, but then the problem is, when you're making your policy decisions or when you're making your system change decisions, you're not taking those groups into consideration. And then hard to reach communities are those that are likely to be undercounted by conventional sampling methods. So these are groups of folks often who are experiencing housing instability or homelessness, um, people who maybe don't have regular access to a phone for whatever reason, so that when you're doing phone sampling, surprise, surprise, they're probably going to be missed. Um, so those were some of the groups of folks that we were looking to talk to for this report. And the report had five big sections, and I'm not going to talk about all of them today for time. Um, but I do want to flag that the first section in the report is called Go Throughs 2, because I've also done um, some focus groups with African American young people about a year to a year and a half before. And there were a whole lot of things that all of these young people had in common, so that's what the first section of the report is about. Um, but we're going to focus in today on some of the unique perspectives that we heard from the small enough folks in the small and hard to reach communities and some um, policy implica implications and recommendations and really for you all, partnership implications and recommendations. So who did we talk to? We talked to 26 low-income youth and young adults between 16 and 25 years old across five focus groups. One was in a predominantly white rural community, um, two were with Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander participants. Um, one was with native young people who were living in an urban area. We had a racially diverse group of young people who were experiencing homelessness. And across a couple of the groups, we had young people who self-identified as LGBTQ+. Uh, we mostly were talking to young men, but we did have some young women as well. And we worked in partnership with um, local organizations in these different places to actually set up the focus groups and organize them. One of the first sort of important lessons for partnership is that we know as a national organization, we can't just swoop into a community and assume that people are gonna to wanna to talk to us. It's really important for us to partner with folks who already are working in those communities, who already have relationships, and are sort of willing to extend their social capital on our behalf to say, these people are okay to talk to, yes, you should come participate, this makes sense for you. Um, so, just to make this point again, it was very interesting that the exact same language that we had heard in some of our focus groups with African American young people came out in these focus groups as well. Um, that piece is called Everybody Got Their Go-Throughs, uh, and here we have people relate to what you go through, um, so that was a common thread. Um, and this quote is from uh, the focus group we did in a rural area, which is about what's unique, but that you don't always recognize what's unique is unique. So like, you know, you've been suffering challenges, but you don't know their challenges until you start talking about them in a different manner. Because like for us, it's stuff we live through day to day and don't think of them as challenges. We just think of them as the norm. So these are some of the things that we found that were unique with um, the groups of small and hard to reach communities. There was much more talk about isolation, about suicide, about the role of the military and law enforcement in these communities, um, of historical and cultural trauma, and the role of cultural supports. And that's what we're gonna zoom in on today. Um, but I'm hoping that the slide will be made available to you all afterwards, so anybody who wants to check out the full report can also do that later. So I was, um, this is a quote from one of the young people that we spoke to that really speaks to this historical and cultural trauma piece. Um, it immediately thought about like how like the Japanese and the Americans came over to Chuk Micronesia and had like a war. Now like a lot of Americans died, a lot of Japanese died, but they forgot about how much our people died, all the bystanders. How like my grandma told me this one story about how her cousin was kicked out of, like her cousins and her people were kicked out of the island so they could use the island for like military use, a base. So that kind of triggered me. Um, and I start with this quote, or talk about this quote, um, for a lot of reasons, but you know, this is stuff that happened during World War II, right? Getting to be a long time ago at this point. But this young person was saying, this is impacting my life and my community and my family right now, right? Um, and so 
it's really important for us to think about what that means in our work when we have things that happened a long time ago that are still being felt acutely by families today and when we don't, what it also means when we don't acknowledge those things or don't speak to young people about these things. So I'm fortunate, if I can, there you go, to have a um, talented younger colleague who made a video for us about um, historical and cultural trauma to really sort of lay some of this out. So we're going to watch it. It's just two minutes. Um, I'll see if I can get it to play. If not, my friend's going to help me in the back. Um, and then we'll go into discussion. Ooh, nope. It's all you, my friend. <laughs> The legacy of oppression has left stains of historical and cultural trauma. Communities have experienced historical trauma over time and across generations through slavery, colonization, discrimination, and anti-immigrant policies. Cultural trauma occurs when members of a group feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves enduring marks on their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. When the Japanese and the Americans came over to troop Micronesia and had a war, people paid attention to the number of Americans and Japanese that died, but they forgot about how much of our people died. Innocent lives gone. When the war was over, they never left. Our people were kicked out of the island. My auntie had land, but the government came and forced her to give it up. She wanted to resist, no matter how much money the government gave her, they took her choice. They took her land. Today, our groups continue to experience trauma at school and in our communities. At school, the adults would tell us mental illness isn't real. They gave us spiels about how we didn't love Jesus. For my friends and I, religion just has too big of a hand in the community that we grew up in. When our culture is devalued or destroyed, we lose a source of strength. These cultural hurts chip away at our identity development and coping strategies. Our policies must confront historical and cultural trauma with cultural healing. To learn more, read Behind the Asterisk at www.plastic.org. All right, and we'll get back to the PowerPoint. Fabulous, thank you. Perfect, okay. Um, so this is going to take us into our first discussion, um, and I may have lied about our groups because I think that's going to make the conversations too big. Um, so what I'm going to do is a little bit of a teacher technique. We're going to do a turn and talk. Um, so everybody's just going to find a partner or maybe a group of no more than three, and we're going to spend five minutes talking about these two questions. How do historical and cultural trauma show up in this community or your community, if your community is not this community? Um, and what does that mean for collaboration and partnership? So we're going to take five minutes to talk about that with a partner, and then we'll just have a few people share out what they talked about in their conversation. And your five minutes starts now. All right. Thank you all for coming with me with the power to the people. Um, so now we're going to take a minute just to hear from a few folks. My, uh, my friend Dana is over, over here is going to run the mic. Anybody want to share anything that they talked about in their group? Um, I, my personal story is that I know nothing really about my family history. Like my, I know I have pictures of me with my great-great-grandmother, and I knew her. I remember her. But in my family, it was kind of taboo to talk or ask questions about our past. So I know we lived all over the country. I don't know why we moved. I don't know who everybody was married to or even what we, when people ask me what I am, I have no idea what I am. So that's kind of a personal trauma for me is not knowing anything about my history. Thank you. Nothing else to share? Can get some stuff. So we talked about, uh, from a historical perspective, what the weather has caused from a traumatic perspective, especially for our youth. Um, you think about, we talked about 
the ongoing onslaught of um, hurricanes that have hit and tropical storms that have hit Houston. And it's gotten to the point, and I know some of the educators in the room can relate to this, if a student hears rain pounding on the outside of the school, there's anxiety. I mean, these, these students are freaking out. And it's because of that trauma associated with the experiences of the weather phenomena that has um, been an onslaught here in Houston. So that's huge. Thank you. Can we maybe get one more to share? You're just making me work. We, in our two-person group, we discuss uh, religion and the effects uh, on our young people. Uh, we see more and more young. The churches are empty as far as having our young population of individuals attend church. When the, the uh, character was speaking on the film, we both had the same thought came in the mind. How, why is that, that the church is empty when it comes to young people? And so... Um, after now we're discussing maybe the church has to do a better job in its efforts to reach out to the younger population because historically we were told we had to go to church every Sunday. We didn't have, it wasn't up for a debate, it wasn't an option. That's the way we were brought up. And so now in my household and, and as the film was going on, I'm like, wow, I can relate to that. How can we reach out to our younger population and bring them back in? Um, so that is a big concern in how to bring them back into the church. And the church has to come up with better ideas and solutions if we want to have them there. And that's a great segue. People always set me up for the next thing. It's beautiful. Um, so that's where we're going to go next. So what are some things that young people say? Um, institutions, organizations can do and should do um, to help address these types of issues that we're, um, that we're raising. Um, and they really talked about the role and value of cultural supports in addressing some of these things. And I'm gonna share um, a few quotes to talk about what that looks like. Um, so first we talked about sort of the arts generally. Um, and this quote is from a young person actually here in Texas who said, and what keeps me Things that distract me from my feelings, you know? It's me playing my games and creating music. All that is just the only thing. The things that I'm doing is just making me stronger right now. It stopped me from like breaking down and crying because of what's going on with my issue of being homeless. That's powerful, right? This young person is talking about the role that music is playing in really sustaining him through a very difficult time in his life. I think we heard some of that this morning from um, a few people on the panel and that presented about the role that arts can play in really helping young people um, to deal with, go through, address different situations. Then we also heard um, from young people about cultural ceremony very specifically. Um, and we're going to get in a second to the quote that talks about the exercise that we did at the beginning. Um, but first, this one was from um, a native young person who said, I came here every Thursday. We did culture class. We did dancing. And they also have activities here for the little kids like making dream catchers, everything. Just, you know, putting native stuff so that they can know their culture. And then, um, speaking to the piece we did at the beginning, while we were doing name, home, ancestor, usually we do this in our space with the kids. Part of it is to remember who we are, where we come from. Um, so these are two examples about how very specific cultural practices and learning about cultural practices um, can really be a way for young people to connect with their culture, connect with um, maybe what they're disconnected from, and a way to sort of take head on some of this uh, cultural loss and cultural trauma that young people have experienced. And then youth culture, which this one can be sticky. That's why I asked earlier how, where are all my under 25s at. Um, because uh, there can sometimes be, uh, there, well, I think it's probably always been this way, where older people tend to look down on young people's culture. But young people have their own culture that has its own value and its own resonance. And um, this next post sort of speaks to how um, young people draw some value to something that's really important to them today. For me, it's access to the internet and the freedom of information that happens because of that. 
which is why I would say I understand why I'm so different than the people around me and like terms to define what exactly I am. And it's led me to have a bunch of great friends and people I can truly care about that live in many different places of the world and have different struggles locally to where they are, but also realize that on a national level, we struggle with a lot of the same things. Um, so this is a young person who's saying, through access to the internet, right, I can not only sort of find other people like me, connect to other people like me, and to see sort of the commonality and struggle on a much broader scale than some of us older folks were ever able to in our day and time. Um, so this is something that you can use, right? Thinking about, you know, a lot of times we think about technology as the enemy. I know I tell my own kids, if y'all don't get off that tablet, I swear to God. But um, there is also strength to be gained and um, tools that can be used in that space that are particularly effective for young people. So now we're going to go back into our turn and talk small group conversations. And I would love for you to talk with your partner or small group about what, what cultural supports are available to young people in this community or your community, and how might cultural supports be a part of building collaboration and partnership, particularly thinking about some of what we were saying before, like institutions like the church and things like that. How could cultural tools be a way of sort of renewing or re-energizing these partnerships? Five minutes. Starts now. Right, I think we have everybody at back. And I'm gonna send my friend Dana running again. Um, who would like to share something that you discussed in that last segment? Okay. Hello, um, for the first question for the cultural support that we have in 77021 is the Little League team. So that's football, Little League cheerleaders, Baseball, softball, we have those. And the reason that I say those teams are so important is because sometimes that's all the kids have. It's the coaches that look after them on and off their field. When I say off their field, the parents will call and say, well, hey, little Bobby did, I'm going to need you to, and, and they, um, they, they want to do right because the coaches care enough. Um, how can they, how many coaches are supposed to be, um, a building collab. So the parents, the coaches work with the parents, and even a lot of times the parents don't even come to the games. So the coaches go and they pick the kids up, they feed the kids before we take them home. I say we because I'm a cheer coach. <laughs> <laughs> we feed them before we take them home so they don't have to worry about the last meal. Maybe a bath or so, but they don't have to worry about the last meal. And a lot of times those kids appreciate everything that we do for them. Thank you, yes, my sense that uh, sports culture is strong down here in Houston. <laughs> uh, who else has one to share? Okay. Well, to answer like the first question, um, possibly like mentorships and um, parent engagements are kind of like important and um, also like having like support groups for um, like children and stuff like that. And, um, what's the last one? Oh, um, like a youth advisory committee. Um, kind of just like to engage them, have them have a voice. Um, so yeah, like at Dream Academy, like um, the students are using Duolingo as like to learn different languages and stuff like that. So um, yeah, just having kids have a voice and being engaged and stuff like that. I saw one more in the back somewhere. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Get your steps in there. Get your steps in Get my steps in and got my Fitbit on. <laughs> so what, what we talked about, we both worked for um, a um, public charter high school that works with um, its dropout recovery system. And we were talking about that there are a lot of cultural supports in the community that we could access. And even when we do everything to remove all the barriers, we, we bring them to our schools, we feed the students who, who would stay and participate. Um, it's just getting them to want to participate. Or maybe they show up for the first you know, meeting and then it just drops off. So like their attention span is so low um, so we could find all these cultural supports and bring them but how do we get our students to um, to take advantage of that 
And just to clarify, so have you invited in cultural groups before, or that would be new? To, to my knowledge, so I'm in San Antonio, my colleague is new, she's in Houston, we're in the five major markets in Texas. Cultural support, um, newer. Well done, y'all. Uh, so now we're gonna go into a little bit about um, forming those partnerships and sort of how you think about what you bring in. Um, again, based on a different set of reports, again, when you hopefully get these slides, if you click on this picture, it'll take you to them if you wanna read the whole thing. Um, but this series we call Policy for Transformed Lives. And for this, we didn't talk to um, young people, other than to the extent that they were working in um, city or state governments. Um, but this was more focused on systems leaders and policy makers in different places. Um, and we talked to folks in four states and three localities. That was New Mexico, Michigan, Oregon, Maryland, Los Angeles, New York City, and Louisville, Kentucky, um, to hear about things that were working for young people, that weren't working for young people, um, what the needs are, what should be changed, um, across a whole bunch of systems. So child welfare folks, juvenile justice folks, homelessness folks, educators, youth development people, youth workforce development people, really a broad range of people um, who impact young people's lives. Um, and sort of the, one of the key things that came out of it that this series of papers takes there, it's title from, I'm not gonna read this whole quote because it's long, um, but this was basically a gentleman from Louisville who was talking about how uh, we do our mental health work as though it's McDonald's, right? Where we're trying to get people to eat the burgers, we want them to be tasty enough that they come back, not too expensive so that they don't come back, and so you count what you're doing for who and for how long and that sort of thing. Um, but what we're really trying to do and what we all signed up for when we got into mental health work is transforming people's lives. And what would it look like if our system was set up so that was the focus instead of having to count and bill and make something a little bit better or tweak this or tweak that as opposed to be truly being truly transformational. So a part of what came out of our conversations with all these systems leaders was um, this framework that we do a bunch of different things around at class um, to try and sort of push folks to make policy that is better for young people. And so um, part of why we're friends with the Prevention Institute is prevention was one of the big things that we talked about. Social determinants of health was one of the big things that we talked about. Um, as well as focusing on young people's wellness as opposed to just sort of what's wrong with them. Or, and, so, and for that, really for young people meant um, building strengths, assets, and safety, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And we're really trying to think about how you fit those pieces into a more complete puzzle for young people. But also really important to the conversation we're having today is that middle part, what are the ways that we have to operate to really support this? And two of the key things that we're gonna talk about in a little bit more detail in that list are um, partnering effectively across sectors and doing it with a racial equity and culturally relevant lens. To my point about what you bring in that. Um, so I'm gonna take a minute more on sort of wellness and what young people said that means, because that's where we started, right? We didn't even want to necessarily assume that we knew how young people talk about mental health or what they think mental health is and what it means, right? Um, and so this actually came out of um, the piece I alluded to earlier in the beginning of African American young people, where we asked them sort of what mental health meant to them. And what they came up with was sort of an affirmative vision about things they wanted to be, skills they wanted to have, ways they wanted to be in the world, um, things that they value. Now this is not how your typical psychologist, psychiatrist, clinical social worker, what have you, talks about mental health, right? It's not how a lot of our system is set up to support mental health. But this is what young people are saying matters. And this is the lens that we need to have, again, when we bring things into them, if we're gonna really meet their needs and really get it to what it is that they're interested in. Um, so here's the interesting thing, and why I'm gonna talk about the example from LA really quickly. The places that were best at doing that kind of work with young people, again, were not traditional mental health spaces. It was the youth development programs, to some extent the youth workforce development programs, it's sort of other kinds of spaces that young people are in that are better oops, I can't do that. I can't do that. At, the, at the wellness stuff. Um, so this is an example of an organization we talked to in Los Angeles, which was out of their mayor's office, 
which was a um, gang called uh, GRID, Gang Reduction Youth Development. And what they did was work with kids who had either been involved in a gang or were at risk of involvement of a gang and had them things, doing things like organizing community events and having the young people lead and run that. Um, they had them doing things like, um, yes, they could access traditional therapy or something like that if that's what they felt like they needed. But it was really about creating self, uh, safe spaces, giving young people the opportunity to lead and to use their leadership skills in a positive way and really tap into the strengths that these young people had that maybe nobody had ever asked to have, had nobody ever asked them to lean on before. Um, and then I'm going to give another example from Louisville where, um, where they were very good at bringing together both partnering our cross sectors and applying our racial equity and culturally responsive lens. And what we, um, so Louisville is a place where, you know, long history of racism, segregation, all those sorts of things still playing out today, a lot of historical cultural trauma there. Um, but there was really a lot of consensus in bringing together leaders in the city around this tree, which I now use this analogy all the time. So if you look at the top of the tree, the leaves, that's the part you can see easily, that's the outcomes, right? Different folks have different outcomes, just like different leaves on the tree can look a little bit different from each other. But what they said that was really important is that you have to look at the roots, the root causes, or the social determinants of health that are at the bottom of the tree. And the other thing that was pretty unique there, but really powerful, is that they also think about the soil that the tree is going, growing in, right? Which they said, that's the systems of power, that's the isms, based on race, based on gender, based on age, based on a whole bunch of other factors that are actually the thing that's nourishing the roots, right? So if you're not thinking about education, economics, health, access to safe neighborhoods, this, the, what the neighborhood looks like, all those sorts of things, if you're not thinking about the ways that racism and sexism and adultism and homophobia and all those sorts of things are feeding those roots, then you're going to be confused about why your leaves look the way that you look. So we can't just look at the leaves and think that we're going to get to the root of the problem that's creating the different outcomes that we have for young people. And what was really powerful in Louisville was that they really brought a broad group of stakeholders together around this idea that a lot of people to buy into it. So it was sort of a common place from which they could have conversations about, okay, how do we collectively work together to move young people forward here in Louisville? So back to our small group and our partnerships uh, for one more time. And this time, I would love you to talk with your partner or small group about who is working intentionally to build young people's strengths, assets, and safety in this community or in your community? And who are some new partners that you could connect with to bring together that kind of focus with a focus on racial equity? Because uh, to the point that our friend was making before, every partner is not the right partner for trying to reach young people. Every partner doesn't bring the right kind of lens, the right kind of framework, the right kind of understanding into the space. And if you're not careful about who your partners are, yeah, then you are going to have young people that don't want to show up because they don't trust that you're bringing people to them that um, they can relate to, that share their goals, share their values, that kind of thing. So we're going to take five minutes, starting now. All right, I'm sending Dana to work again. Who would like to share something that they discussed? And we got one right there. Okay, so for the first part, um, based on our discussion, we felt like as a whole, in terms of, you know, the community, the who's only exist when it's almost too late, when there are barriers, right? Not necessarily pulling out strength and assets. So we thought that was a, a, a large problem that we have as a community, you know, um, as a whole. We only talk about the who's when it's almost too late. You call someone when CPS is about to pull the kid out of the house, you call um, NPC or the Harris Center when there's a crisis. So I think we need a lot more done on that side. And in terms of community partners, I just met a group. I did tell them I was gonna give them a shout out. Boys and Girls Country. Seems like they do amazing things for children um, between age five and 18, and we don't have a lot of that here. We have a lot of things for adolescents, but not necessarily children at that age range. So um, talk to them. Awesome. Let them tell you what they do. Thank you. Um, 
Well, we work with children and teenagers. We have a CPS contract and a few CPS kids. The majority of our kids are voluntary placements uh, from grandparents who are having difficulty because of their health or uh, their finances, single parents. And the children live with us, go to school in the Waller School District. They can live with us through high school. We have a college and career program after that. And um, so we, uh, the family stays in contact with the children and uh, visits with them. It's much less invasive than a CPS placement because they stay in basically partnering with us. So, so we're glad to hear from anybody. <laughs> New partners, and we got one all the way up front, Dana. Oh, okay. Just keep it moving. Hi, I really talk, really want to talk about this topic based on um, what I experienced. Um, I work with a lot of um, teens and adolescents, and I realize the common themes that um, talking about feeling. Uh, is a very sensitive topic for them. They rarely talk about how they feel, what they think. And um, I have a client, I talk to her, I ask her, um, do you normally have a conversation with your mom um, about how you feel, what you think? She didn't know. That's really weird. Um, we need to talk about that. And when I talked to the parents, and she said, we usually have a lot of open conversation with each other. Um, then I asked her, so what you guys talk about? So she said that I normally check on her school and uh, what stuff she like, uh, music and food, and uh, make sure that she have enough clothes and you know material things like that. Um, but I asked, do you ask how she feel? No, I never ask that, and unless you want to talk to me about that. So I feel like uh, youth, they don't really um, have a chance, or they don't really know how to express their feeling, and sometimes I feel like they don't know how to name them out. Like, I ask them, how you feel? I don't feel anything. But, you know, actually they feel a lot of things, but they just don't know how to feel. So, how can they have strength and safety if they don't really have validation from other people around them? So, I don't know, but I feel like we don't really have enough uh, activity uh, to educate and teaching parents how to talk or how to have a conversation with their children in an appropriate way um, to really express their feeling. Yeah. Thank and you. I don't know what partners or what role <laughs> <laughs> we can Don't worry about it, but it's an important observation, right? Because um, there's a, a gentleman that is on the advisory board for class mental health work who talks a lot about how youth of color are told their whole lives that their opinion doesn't matter, and then you sit them down in therapy and ask them about their feelings, or ask them what they think, when they've been told their whole life that doesn't matter, right? So we have to change that narrative up front for young people to even get in a space where they feel like what they have to say does matter, will be taken seriously, is worth expressing, and so that they have the language to actually be able to do that. Um, okay, we can maybe go one more. One more. I'm just going to piggyback on what the young lady just said a minute ago. In working with um, communities, um, I, I see that it's so important to work with the, the teachers uh, inside the school system. Um, in particular, uh, I was having a conversation with one of my son's teachers who sent us an email for him to um, um, read a book and had a project over the Christmas, over the holiday break. And so I emailed him back and I said, man, you know, you, you're taking time away from my home. We have to go out on a project. So my son is in the, at the time he was in the 11th grade. He's a senior this year. So I said, well, now we're going to have to go out and work on this project for him for school because it's it's so much homework around the holidays. So I said, let me make a suggestion to you. I told this to the teacher. I said, well, how about if you assign your class uh, a movie to watch over the holidays? They can access it through Netflix, Amazon, you pick one. Because I see a struggle with children and adolescents being able to communicate. Expressing their feelings is so crucial. They don't know how to start a conversation. They don't know how to, to express how they feel. When I go out and I do home assessments, and talking with young people, being able to say what we want to say, 
School has become such an institution of following the rules. It used to be a creative mind where kids can come and speak their thoughts and express themselves. They, we've taken so much creativity away from the teachers, so I believe that we can partner up with our school systems and let them, as parents first, voicing our concerns on what we see, even as professionals, letting the school system see how we can really work to value the minds of our young people, allowing them an opportunity to express themselves. That's fair. So that's why I took that one more comment to get my setup that I always get. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to close down with a few implications for you all to take with you in terms of thinking about your partnerships and collaborations. Um, I really like this quote that talks about how we all need to come together. This young man said, instead of coming together, everybody nice, getting together and get the schools right for kids, stop building all these daggone jails and all this dumb stuff they're spending money on, put it in the things they need to be put into. This is a young person telling us, we know where the investments need to be made. We know what can make a difference in our community. We need you all to come together and help us make that happen. So two important points. Um, all of our partnerships and collaborations must include impacted populations, including people from communities of color, low-income communities, young people, et cetera, at every stage of the planning and implementation process to disrupt patterns of inequality. So back to my friend in the back, have you all sat with the young people and asked them who they want to bring into the school? Have we had them write the invitations? Have they, we had them identify the groups and do the research and take the lead on it? Because as soon as you do that, of course they're gonna show up because they set the whole thing up. Right? We got to think about making sure that we are asking, involving, inviting, partnering, sharing power with young people as we're making decisions in these spaces in order to, and it's only going to make our events, our systems, our programs, our organizations more successful because we've done it with them instead of just for them. And secondly, um, we really need to explicitly consider the unique histories, needs, and experiences of small and hard to reach communities in collaborations focused on mental health. Whoever is small and hard to reach where you are, because it's different groups and different places, but we need to make sure that we're thinking about those folks that are showing up as an asterisk in those reports, because their experience has implications for whatever it is that we're trying to do, and if we don't take that into account, there's no way that we're gonna get equity for the entire community. So we're going to close, I think I probably killed our question time, um, so we're going to go to reflections and I'll hang out at the end. Um, so this is that moment where I need y'all to take out your phones for me, and if my friend in the back can take us to that page. Yep, and just hit the full screen box. Yep. Okay, so the first thing I need everybody to do is to take out your phone and text Neo West Bay 309 to 22333. So 22333 is the phone number. Neo West Bay 309 is the text message that you're sending. Once you do that, you should get some kind of um, message back that says, hey, thank you, you've joined the poll. Um, and then once you do that, you can text your answer to this question. What is one idea that you'll carry with you into your partnerships and collaborations to support youth well-being? And as people start to send the text, we'll start to see things here. There we go. <laughs> Right, so the phone number is 22333. So you're gonna put 22333, and to that, you're gonna write Neo West Bay 309. And then you should get a message back that says, you've joined the poll. There you go. Oh, um, so you can also do it from there, but it's easier to do it directly from your phone if you can get the text bar to work. Then once you've done that, if you start texting your responses to this question, then we'll start to get this stuff that we're gonna here. So some people are succeeding, there we go. There we go. And the way this works is the bigger the word is, the more people are using it in their text. There we go. 
There we go. Yep, so the phone number is two, oh, okay, so it's in network phone. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, there are limitations on the numbers I can't answer, but we do have a pretty little word cloud here <laughs> that came out. So hopefully some of y'all got something out of this that you're taking with you. Um, and I will do this because I realized I forgot to um, restock. Oh, sorry. Can we go back to the PowerPoint um, mm -hmm. one final time? I forgot to uh, give myself more cards after my last thing on Friday. So if you need to find me, this is my email address. Please do shoot me an email. I'm happy to answer your, any questions that you have or any follow-up. And I'll be here for the rest of the day. Thank you all so much.